This is Andrew. He's a research physicist at a private lab in Montreal. Here, in his spare time, he's modifying an old CRT, one of those black and white cathode ray tube televisions. He's making it into an oscilloscope. That's a piece of diagnostic equipment that displays waves on a screen. What he's doing is called a circuit bend. That means he's altering an existing circuit to get it to do new things. A bend is a type of hack. This hack allows him to use the television to see things that aren't normally visible. What you're seeing is a, a laboratory collective called Foo Lab. It's a loft in an old industrial building where people get together to hack, repair, alter, repurpose, combine, or otherwise modify technology. To give you an idea, while we were there, this guy, Redbeard, brings in this thing. It's a sort of proto-fax machine combining the telegraph and the typewriter. What did you, what did you say the thing was called again? It's called the teletype. teletype. Teletype, it's called. This one's from 1938. Within two hours of arriving, he's got it partly up and running. Soon, uh, he's going to make it receive text messages from cell phones and updates from the internet and stuff like that. Yeah. I guess the part that intrigued me was that it's like sort of this, this mesh between electronics and logic and mechanics. You know, it's electromechanical and... Uh, you know, now you just, we don't have devices like these anymore, you know, everything is integrated or, you know, whatever. But this is like, oh, man, it's just like uh, mechanical and electrical. It's the best of both worlds. This is Maxter. He has no formal engineering training, but he's been tinkering all his life, and he's worked for a robotics company as well. Here he's building himself a custom boombox out of junk he collected. I figured it would go well with this. Ideally, we'd have a computer in here, and this would pop open, you'd have a screen right here, a keyboard. He's one of the founding members of FooLab. How it started is that um, for a while, I, I, I was looking on the internet, like sites like Make and Hackaday and stuff like that. And I saw stuff about hacker spaces, like, you know, uh, all the ones in like the New York NYC resistors, and then, you know, all the other ones that are just sprouting all over the place. And I was like, yeah, you know what? The lab is a collective space with a voting membership of a little over a dozen. They share resources and have weekly meetings to vote on collective issues. For instance, whether to let people film in the lab. My apartment was pretty small and I couldn't really work late at night and stuff like that. I couldn't make much noise. I couldn't get like all these wonderful tools we have here. Uh, so I was like, you know, we should pool our resources and I'm sure we can find enough people in Montreal to start a space like this. This community is big. There are spaces like this all over the world. They, they meet and share ideas at big conferences and festivals. But I still wasn't sure. I wasn't still set uh, on starting one until we went to this conference in New York and they had a talk about like uh, starting a hacker spaces or not starting a hacker spaces. And uh, so then we attended a couple of those and we met another guy from Montreal, Hugo, in New York. And then we uh, basically said, all right, let's, you know, uh, we're all interested. You guys want to start one, we want to start one. 
So then I was like, all right. So when I got back in Montreal, I just made some little business cards, emailed a lot of people, emailed a lot of uh, mailing lists and uh, blogs in Montreal, like Montreal Tech Watch. And then it was just all networking and stuff and spreading the word. The music you've been hearing was produced by this guy, Francis, or XC3N. He modifies outdated video game technology to make his music. Nintendos, Commodores, stuff like that. For him, it's all about art. I believe that we spent our childhood playing boring games with excellent music. And that the sound, it's a very raw sound, it's a very specific sound. There's no filters on the Nintendo, there's no filters on the, the Game Boy. It's a very, this is what the sound is, and that's it. It's not something we were used to here either, so it, it, it became impregnated in our minds. It just, it just permeated our childhood. And so when we, you take it out of context, you create this paradox where, that's what I say, it's the, it's the new sound that you've heard before. Because you, everybody's heard the music, but like now it's taking into a new context and it's, it, it, creates a bridge, let's say, between the nostalgia of our childhood playing games and, and listening to that music, not really even taking into consideration that we were listening to music more than, oh, you know, I'm playing a game and there's some sounds coming out of the TV, and just bridge, uh, bridging it back to the, the present, where we, we try to push it even farther. Sean here is a biologist, but on the side he does all sorts of stuff. Here you see him turning graphic designs he's made oh, wait, no, into actually, working circuits using an old industrial printer someone gave him and a tub of acid. It allows me to make high resolution prints uh, directly onto copper foils. Uh, and then when I drop this into etchant, everything that's exposed copper gets eaten away. So it's sort of like a photo development process uh, where, you, where you have a negative and everything that's not uh, not printed on gets eaten away, leaving the opposite of that. And uh, that's what you use to make the circuit. Why should I design the circuit the way that the tools restrict me to? If I do it from scratch uh, with vector graphics, I can make it anything I want. And really, why shouldn't I? I'm not doing this for a job. I mean, I, I can include artwork in my, in my circuit diagrams for all that matters. Um, I, I can make a working, a working photograph of something that's also a circuit. I mean, why shouldn't I? Even the images on Sean's business card are made with copper circuits. Mm -hmm. In the old days of radio, and the government used to publish guides on how to, uh, on how to make radios. That's how the first radios were distributed. They weren't distributed as a, a unit you could buy or sell. But uh, the government published instructions on how to make your own. Uh, televisions were made as things you could repair yourself. But somewhere along the development of the transistor, it became difficult for people to modify or repair their own electronics, or really take control of any of the technolo uh, technology around them. So, in a sense, the hobbyists have, over time, developed better tools that, uh, in the end, are an attempt to regain that sort of control over, uh, over what we use every day. The details are, are pretty astounding on their own. At one point, Sean shows me how to use his oscilloscope, sort of like the thing Andrew was imitating at the beginning, to measure individual particles from a radioactive sample. But these guys aren't just screwing around. They're taking advantage of technological practices that used to be monopolized by industry. They're exploring the boundaries of innovation. They're, they're empowering themselves in a world governed by passive consumer product relationships. Um, and I forget who said it, but the philosophy behind it is shape your tools or you will be shaped by them.